We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. to be here among all of these brilliant speakers, so thank you so much for having me. Human beings occupy two worlds. The real world is what actually happened in the past, is actually happening right now, and will actually happen in the future. And while we certainly think about that world, we also spend this enormous amount of time uh, considering all the many possible worlds, what philosophers and psychologists typically refer to as uh, counterfactuals. That is, all the ways that the world could have been, but wasn't, and all the ways that the world could be, but aren't. And not only is counterfactual thinking pervasive in our everyday thought, perhaps you're doing it right now, um, but engaging with these imagined possibilities deeply affects us. It affects our decisions, it affects our judgments, and it affects our emotional experiences. And from an evolutionary perspective, this initially seems a bit surprising, right? While it's obvious why engaging deeply with our actual real experience would give us some sort of edge, um, it's less obvious what we get from engaging so profoundly and emotionally uh, with these imagined worlds uh, as well. And this seems particularly paradoxical uh, when you consider the huge proportion of time that very young children are engaging with these imaginary worlds. In fact, as soon as babies can talk, they immediately begin talking about the possible in addition to the real. Um, they begin to spontaneously produce symbolic play, uh, substituting things like you know, these mouse from a computer for a telephone very early on, around 18 months. There's even evidence that 15-month-olds are recognizing pretend sequences that are produced by adults in their environment. So that's pretty early. Um, so why, right? Why would very, very young children who, by their very definition, have so much that they have to learn about the actual world, spend so much of their time and energy and resources, not to mention the resources of their caregivers who are responsible for them, um, engaging with unreality? Right? We have to answer this question. So classically, psychologists, including the father of developmental psychology, Jean Piaget, but also our friend Sigmund Freud here, who pops up all over the place, uh, offered some pretty uncharitable characterizations of pretend play in childhood. They essentially attributed its prevalence to children's inability to differentiate between the products of their imaginations and reality, between fantasy and reality. Um, decades of research have shown that, to the contrary, children are actually quite proficient and sophisticated at distinguishing between real objects, events, and people, and those that are products of their imagination and the imaginations of others around them. I'm going to give you just one example of a study. This was conducted by Jackie Woolley, just to show you how this work is typically done with kids. Uh, a child might enter a room with three boxes. They'll, be, they'll watch as an experimenter puts a pencil in box one. Box two is left empty. Uh, in box three, the child is uh, told to imagine that there's a pencil in inside the box. Um, afterwards, the experimenter might ask the child a bunch of questions and engage with them. One of those questions will be, is there a pencil in box three? And children have no problem with this. They say, yeah, sure, right? They, they have no issue with transporting themselves into this imagined space in which there's a pencil inside of box three. But if some person comes in from the other room who wasn't engaged in this fictional context initially and says, uh, hey, I need a pencil. Can you give me one? Uh, children, even as young as two, aren't going to make the mistake of looking in box three, right? They know 
sure there's no actual pencil in there. Instead, they reach into box one and give the experimenter what it is that they actually asked for, right? So even though children spend hours and hours of their lives pretending, um, they know that they're pretending. Um, and this ability then to adopt this counterfactual or false premise, like there's a pencil inside of this cup, to make inferences about events that might happen in a world in which there were a pencil in the cup, but also to separate, right, that imagined space from the real world is already present from as early as two years of age. So this is very, very early on. Um, in fact, there's other prominent features of pretend play that suggest that it's the result of competence uh, rather than cognitive limitations. So it's largely unique uh, to human beings. It's often social in nature, like many of our more complex functions. It becomes increasingly elaborate over time. You'd, you'd expect the opposite, right, if it was the result of a cognitive limitation. Young children do this object substitution. As they get a little bit older, they don't even need objects to scaffold their pretend play with. They just imagine things, completely imaginary events. A little bit later, they might develop an imaginary friend or companion, right? This is an entity that has a consistent psychology that they interact with over time, a rich and complex psychology in social life. Um, even later, in late childhood and adolescence even, uh, children engage with um, paracosm, so little micro worlds that they construct of their own design. Um, and of course, as we know, this extends um, into adulthood as well. We all appreciate fictional artifacts, um, and this is continuous uh, throughout the lifespan. Okay. so. Given that very young children engage with imaginary worlds, which seems, seems obvious, um, and that this engagement doesn't stem from their confusion, which is a bit less obvious, but not so much anymore, um, then why are they doing it, right? Why are they doing it and how? How are they doing it? Well, we know that play is characteristic of young animals across a wide range of species, and that the behaviors that are involved in play are also those that will typically be most important for adults of that species. And in this way, play is a form of exploratory learning. So the immature animal uh, can explore and practice alternative forms of action in a low cost, low risk environment without any of the pressures of having to actually achieve a particular goal, like staying alive, for example. Um, and in fact, one of the most distinctive features, um, biological features of human beings is our unusually long period of immaturity. Compared with our closest primate relatives, we've evolved to have this dramatically extended protected period of childhood, uh, early, middle, late adolescence, after we go to college, right? We're still protected in this period of immaturity. Um, and uh, what we're encouraged to do is explore during this period of time. We're engaging in this exploratory learning. So while it's sort of easy to see how physical forms of exploratory play, like play fighting and hunting and climbing, um, might translate into later adult skills, uh, pretend play is sort of by its very definition severed from reality, right? So in order to make this analogy with play, with other forms of play work, we have to really identify the role that this particular type of cognition, this counterfactual type of cognition plays in cognition. Um, so to put this in a form of a question, why might it be beneficial to draw conclusions from false premises, like there's a pencil in the cup? So to answer this question, we can uh, consider how children's minds are constructed to support and also to encourage their generation of a wide array of alternative possibilities. And it turns out that new ideas about children's earliest learning mechanisms suggest that the very same abilities that allow children to learn so much about the world and to reason so powerfully about it also allows them to imagine alternatives to that world. And more specifically, it's the ability to represent cause and effect relationships that seems to underpin some of the ability to imagine uh, possible worlds. And not only that, but the ability to imagine possible worlds feeds back to facilitate our reasoning about cause and effect relationships. So the rest of this talk, I'm going to very quickly try to unpack the sort of theoretical grounds uh, for making this claim. So by about five years of age, children have already developed complex causal theories in a variety of domains, everything from understanding biological principles to other minds, to the nature of physical forces and properties in the world. And the question that motivates my research, but also just sort of the fields of cognitive development in general, is how this ever happens. How is it that young children are able to learn these abstract, structured, causal representations of the world so quickly and accurately, given the relatively limited information that's available to them uh, from their senses? What's the origin of this knowledge? And one classic answer from developmental psychology um, points to the similarities between children's learning and learning in science. And the idea here proposes that children's early theories share, in a meaningful way, um, structure, 
function and dynamics uh, to theory change um, in science. And in particular, that children, just like little scientists, are implicitly formulating hypotheses about the world uh, and then testing and rationally revising those hypotheses in light of new evidence that they observe. So this sounds a bit far-fetched when you first hear it. Uh, to help you imagine this, I'm going to show you a video of this idea. Um, what this child is doing in this video uh, is playing with a blicket detector, which is a toy that we typically use in my lab. This is just a flexible causal system. It's a box that lights up, which is the effect, for certain things, which is the cause. And it allows us to explore children's causal inferences really well. Um, so I'm just going to let you watch it. And I want you to keep an eye out for this child engaging in hypothesis testing behavior, similar to a scientist. This and the box, and this and the box. Look. Uh huh. That, this makes that light up the box. Mm hmm. How about this? That makes the other side. Here's a new hypothesis. Ah. Oh. This one's lighting up, and this one's not. So that means... Here's another. Hmm. What's making this light up? Hmm. It's a familiar expression to those of us who do science. <laughs> Despair. This was the child's idea, pretty imaginative. <laughs> And like in science, it ends with embarrassment in front of our peers. <laughs> so even though um, these ideas about children's learning have been around for some time, recently there's been some major advances in our ability to formally describe the cognitive processes that might be taking place. And the way that this is done is by integrating developmental psychology, so this kind of work uh, with computational theories. Um, so one of the central ideas in this framework is that children's intuitive causal theories can be expressed in a kind of causal map or abstract picture of how the world works, a little bit like this, right? So for example, sunlight and water cause plants to grow, forces and contact cause objects to move through space, desires and beliefs cause someone to act towards a particular goal. And in many ways, these causal maps are analogous to the more familiar spatial maps that depict the various locations of objects in relation to one another. Um, this is a cognitive feature that we share with other animals, including rodents, like depicted here. Um, so having a spatial map is useful, right? And this was mentioned earlier, because it allows for this non-egocentric representation of knowledge, right? It doesn't matter if, where I am in the space, I can still represent the space. This means that it's flexible, right? I can plan my route um, in advance and think about the different ways that I might approach this problem. And it becomes updated as new information about the space um, becomes available. So in a similar way, having a causal map provides a complex representation of the causal relationships or an abstract picture of how one thing might be causally connected to another. And just like our spatial maps, it's updated as new information becomes available to us. So you can think of each of these different causal models as a particular hypothesis that we might hold about the true causal structure of the world. So for example, if I notice that the flowers in my window begin to wilt, I might entertain several possible causal models, each of which generate their own patterns of predictions, right? Um, so it could be that too much sunlight is causing um, uh, both the dry soil and the wilted flowers, or it could be that the sunlight is actually uh, causing the dry soil and it's the dry soil, right, that's causing my flowers to wilt. And if I'm holding uh, a causal model that happens to be correct, then the predictions that it generates will be accurate with respect to my observations in the world, right? But if it's incorrect, if I hold the wrong causal model, my predictions are going to fail me. Um, and this will prompt me to adjust my causal model to better approximate the true causal structure of the world. So in effect, this process, the process of early learning, uh, might be conceived as a process of comparing possible worlds and updating those possibilities in light of new evidence um, as you observe it. 
And critically, these causal maps also include a means for representing possible future actions for planning in the world. So if we return to the two sort of versions of the wilted flowers that I described earlier, um, even though each of these representations have the same variables, right, sunlight, soil, flowers, the differences in their structure lead to really different effects following some action that it might take on the world, right? So let's say I intervene on my dry soil by watering my plants, right? Hopefully what you can see here is that depending upon which of the two causal structures is an accurate representation of the world, watering my plants here uh, in the first one is gonna have no effect on my flowers, right? Because it's the sunlight that's directly causing them to wilt. In the, in the other case though, watering the soil will, will actually um, have some effect. And importantly, these interventions could be real, I could actually do them, um, or they can be imagined hypothetical actions, right? I can just sort of think what it would be like if I were to intervene on the world in a particular way. And it turns out that the evidence shows that even preschool-aged children are able to do this, are able to reason about interventions both in the real world and also in their imaginations. So this gives us an extremely powerful tool uh, for planning and considering the outcomes of potential actions in advance. We start with a premise that might be false with respect to the world, and then we just reason about the implications of that premise downstream. This leads us to the ability to design new interventions and to literally um, change the future uh, for ourselves and our environment. So now we have to push the pause button for a minute because this all sounds really, really complicated to us. Uh, all of these things are, of course, happening implicitly, not explicitly. But you might be wondering whether or not kids could actually do this. So if we return to pretend play for a minute, we see that children are routinely considering premises that contradict their own knowledge. Um, they ignore the fact that the teacup is empty, and they proceed to wipe up the imagined tea when the cup is overturned anyway. Really, any time, really, that children are acting out the outcome of pretend events, they're necessary setting aside their interpretation, their causal model of the real world, and reasoning about the causal consequences of some pretend premise, right, some other possible world. Um, and in fact, it's causation itself that gives fantasy its logic. Um, despite the fact that children could, in principle, pretend about anything at all, it's pretend after all, if you've ever hung out with children, you know that they don't actually usually do this, right? Um, instead, some research by Paul Harris has shown that if a child pretends to spill the sugar during their tea party, they're gonna opt to sweep it up with a broom. If they spill the milk, then they'll grab a mop, right, or a sponge. Um, and it's precisely this unique blend of knowledge and imagination that really characterizes early pretend play in childhood. And in fact, the cognitive processes that are involved in pretend play aren't only useful for planning, they're also critical um, for learning. Um, so for example, children who create imaginary companions tend to show increased theory of mind. Um, so this is just an increased understanding of the cause and effect relationships that dictate the psychological and social world. Uh, so I propose then that pretend play is really just a precocious display of children's developing abilities in causal raising. It arises out of those abilities quite naturally. Um, and that engagement in imaginary worlds actually feeds back um, to serve as an engine of learning as well, promoting these abilities that we need. Um, so to sort of summarize the logic in a single slide here, uh, the long period of pro protected immaturity uh, winds up leading to increased time for exploratory learning through play. Um, exploratory play allows for more flexible kinds of learning mechanisms that support the development of causal models that slowly adjust to the environment over time. These models support counterfactual reasoning. It's sort of inherent to the model to think about ways that you might change it in order to think of how things could be different. Um, and this is initially expressed in young children in the context of pretend play really as early as they can uh, start to talk. And finally, that reasoning about these possibilities feeds back uh, to support the very mechanisms that underlie um, causal learning um, in humans. Um, so I'm gonna end with a quote um, from my colleague, Alison Gottnick, uh, with whom I've co-authored all of my work in this area. Um, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.